This is part six of Dimensions, a casebook of alien contact. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please listen with an open mind. Another reality. During the drive between Burford and Stratford I had some startling and, to me, novel insights into what I can only describe as the nature of reality. They were connected in some way to this shining disk, and have had a profound effect on me, causing what is commonly known as a personality change. I won't try to explain what those insights were since almost all the religions of the world have tried to do this and have failed. Letter to the author from a UFO witness. The central question posed by the UFO phenomenon is this, what happens to the witnesses who have a close encounter? Are the abductions real? And, if so, where do these people go? Here again it is useful to take the stories out of the 20th century North American context and to relate them to the larger universe of reports from other times and other places. The secret commonwealth, after all, already took ordinary folks away. So did the denizens of Magonia, and the sky people of American Indian lore. Part 2 of this book is concerned with the direct interaction between humans and these alleged beings, with what we know of their physical reality and their impact on us. As we progress from chapter to chapter in this search, the reader will see the outline of a major fact towering above the haze of human theories and fragile dreams. This is not simply a case of a few tales relating encounters between a few humans and strange creatures from the sky. This is an age-old and worldwide myth that has shaped our belief structures, our scientific expectations, and our view of ourselves. I do not use the word myth here to mean something that is imaginary but on the contrary something that is true at such a deep level that it influences the very basic elements of our thoughts. There are four components to the myth, an emotional component, examined in chapter 4, which takes the form of cosmic seduction, including some stories of sexual encounters that may seem shocking or outrageous but form a significant part of the total problem. Next, in chapter 5, we find the celestial component that encompasses the heavenly signs, the claims of contact with angels and with the creatures of other planets, in other words, the entire tapestry of outside intervention in human affairs. I am careful to use the quaint word celestial here instead of the more precise and convenient extraterrestrial because of the unfortunate misconceptions the latter term now carries in our culture. In Chapter 6 we examine the most difficult topic of UFO research, the psychic component in the sightings. It is an aspect of the phenomenon that all the official studies, and most of the private ones, have tried to avoid, but it is there, and we can no longer close our eyes and minds to it. Ordinary logic does not apply to the paranormal. I have coined the word metalogic to describe the internal consistency of the experience, which often involves observations that are, on the surface, logically absurd. Finally, in Chapter 7, we come to the most powerful and frightening aspect of the UFO myth, the spiritual component that has given us what I have termed a morphology of miracles. From the pillar of fire and the burning bush to apparitions of the Virgin at Fatima and Joseph Smith's visions of Angel Moroni, all the major miracles recorded in human history fit under the mythical framework we have erected. Far from finding it satisfying, I react to this observation with a mixture of awe and humility before the very dimensions of the problem we are attempting to describe with limited human understanding, with scientific resources that have not been tempered by the fiery tricksters of the underworld or brushed by the inspired guidance of the wings of archangels. 4. The Emotional Component, Cosmic Seduction The Case of Jerry Irwin In his book on the folklore of Celtic countries, Walter Evans once reports that the mind of a person coming out of fairyland is usually blank about what has been seen and done there. The same is true in many modern UFO reports. The mind of private first class Jerry Irwin was blank indeed when he woke up on March 2, 1959, in Cedar City Hospital. He had been unconscious for 23 hours, at times mumbling incoherently something about a jacket on the bush. When he became conscious his first question was, were there any survivors? The story of Private Irwin is mysterious, and very little has been done to clarify it. It has been mentioned only once in UFO literature, by the late James Lorenzen, director of the APRO group, and has not, to the best of my knowledge, been the subject of subsequent investigation. Such an investigation, however, would throw light on the sociological context of UFO reports. Perhaps, 
As Lorenzen suggests, there was a military investigation that has been kept secret. If so, secrecy on the part of the authorities, if they are really concerned with the nation's peace of mind, is not the best course. The well-established facts of the Irwin case, which serves as our introduction to a discussion of the problem or contact, makes it clear that open research is now imperative on all aspects of the phenomenon. Late on February 28, 1959, Jerry Irwin, a Nike missile technician, was driving from Nampa, Idaho, back to his barracks at Fort Bliss, El Paso, Texas. He had reached Cedar City, Utah, and turned southeast on Route 14 when he observed an unusual phenomenon six miles after the turnoff. The landscape brightened, and a glowing object crossed the sky from right to left. Irwin stopped the car and got out. He watched the object continue to the east until hidden from view by a ridge. The witness decided that he might have seen an airliner on fire attempting a forced landing, in which case there was no time to lose. Consequently, instead of resuming his journey, Irwin wrote a note, have gone to investigate possible plane crash. Please call law enforcement officers, and placed it on the steering wheel of his car. Using shoe polish, he wrote stop on the side of his car, to make sure people would find his note, and then started out on foot. Approximately 30 minutes later, a fish and game inspector did stop. He took the note to the Cedar City Sheriff, Otto Pfeef, who gathered a party of volunteers and returned to the site. Ninety minutes after he had sighted the strange object, Jerry Irwin was discovered unconscious and taken to the hospital. No trace of an airplane crash was found. At the hospital, Dr. Broadbent observed that Irwin's temperature and respiration were normal. He seemed merely asleep, but he could not be awakened. Dr. Broadbent diagnosed hysteria. Then, when Irwin did wake up, he felt fine although he was still puzzled by the object he had seen. He was also puzzled by the disappearance of his jacket. He was assured that he was not wearing it when he was found by the search party. Irwin was flown back to Fort Bliss and placed under observation at William Beaumont Army Hospital for four days, after which period he returned to duty. His security clearance, however, was revoked. Several days later, Irwin fainted while walking in the camp, but he recovered rapidly. Several days afterward, on Sunday March 15th, he fainted again in an El Paso street and was taken to Southwest General Hospital. There his physical condition was found similar to that observed in Cedar City. He woke up at about 2 a.m. on Monday and asked, were there any survivors? He was told that the date was not February 28th but March 16th. Once more, he was taken to William Beaumont Hospital and placed under observation by psychiatrists. He remained there over one month. Lorenzen reports that, according to a Captain Valentine, the results of the test indicated that Irwin was normal. He was discharged from the hospital on April 17th. The next day, following a very powerful urge, he left the fort without leave, caught a bus in El Paso, arrived in Cedar City Sunday afternoon, April 19th, walked to the spot where he had seen the object, left the road, and went back through the hills, right to a bush where his jacket lay. There was a pencil in a buttonhole with a piece of paper wound tightly around it. He took the paper and burned it. Then he seemed to come out of a trance. He had to look for the road. Not understanding why he had come there, he turned himself in and thus met Sheriff Otto Pfeef, who gave him the details of the first incident. The Lorenzans contacted Irwin after he had returned to Fort Bliss and undergone a new psychological examination, as futile as the previous one. His case came to the attention of the Inspector General, who ordered a new investigation. On July 10th, Irwin re-entered the hospital. On August 1st, he failed to report for duty. One month later he was listed as a deserter. He was never seen again. New Hampshire revisited. The Irwin case is reminiscent of another incident that has become one of the standards of modern American folklore the report by Betty and Barney Hill and their examination under hypnosis by Dr. Benjamin Simon, which has been documented at length by John Fuller in his excellent book The Interrupted Journey. The reader must keep in mind the main features of the Irwin and Hill cases in order to follow the discussion that is the object of this chapter. Report number 10161, in the files of the 100th Bomb Wing, Strategic Air Command, 
Pease Air Force Base, New Hampshire, was prepared by Major Paul W. Henderson. The only official document concerning the Hill case, it contains a detail of which both Dr. Simon and John Fuller were unaware, the object seen by the Hills had been detected by military radar. During a casual conversation on 22 Sept 61 between Major Gardner B. Reynolds, 100th BSDC-01 and Captain Robert O. Dade, Commander 1917-2 Extit, Pease AFB New Hampshire, it was revealed that a strange incident occurred at 0214 local on 20th of September no importance was attached to the incident at the time. The visual sighting itself is summarized as follows, on the night of 19 to 20 Sept between 200001 and 200100 Mr. and Mrs. Hill were traveling south on Route 3 near Lincoln, in H when they observed, through the windshield of their car, a strange object in the sky. They noticed it because of its shape and the intensity of its lighting as compared to the stars in the sky. The weather and sky was clear at the time. In the report itself we read Betty Hill's account of the sighting as reported by Pease Air Force Base officials. The observers were traveling by car in a southerly direction on Route 3 south of Lincoln, New Hampshire, when they noticed a brightly lighted object ahead of their car at an angle of elevation of approximately 45 degrees. It appeared strange to them because of its shape and the intensity of its lights compared to the stars in the sky. Weather and sky were clear. They continued to observe the object from their moving car for a few minutes then stopped. After stopping the car they used binoculars at times. They report that the object was traveling north very fast. They reported changed directions rather abruptly and then headed south. Shortly thereafter it stopped and hovered in the air. There was no sound evident up to this time. Both observers used the binoculars at this point. While hovering, objects began to appear from the body of the object which they describe as looking like wings which made a V-shape then extended. The wings had red lights on the tips. The object continued to descend until it appeared to be only a matter of hundreds of feet above their car. At this point they decided to get out of that area, and fast. They report that while the object was above them after it had swooped down they heard a series of short loud buzzes which they described as sounding like someone had dropped a tuning fork. They report that they could feel these buzzing sounds in their auto. No further visual observations were made of this object. They continued on their trip and when they arrived in the vicinity of Ashland, New Hampshire, about 30 miles from Lincoln, they again heard the buzzing sound of the object, however, they did not see it at this time. Mrs. Hill reported the flight pattern of the object to be erratic, changing directions rapidly, that during its flight it ascended and descended numerous times very rapidly. Its flight was described as jerky and not smooth. This report is remarkable for what it does not contain. In this respect, it is probably typical of a large class of Air Force records, most of those involving close proximity to a UFO, where either witness reluctance or lack of adequate follow-up eliminated the most significant information. In the present case, the witnesses failed to give the Air Force any information as to the beings they could see aboard the craft during their observation with binoculars. And proper investigation would have disclosed an element of which they were not immediately aware. They could not account for a time gap of two hours between the two periods of buzzing sounds. In fact, they could not recall how they had driven the 35 miles between Indian Head and Ashland so casually mentioned in the Air Force report. Both witnesses had a series of strange nightmares. The dreams led them to see a psychiatrist who used hypnosis to discover the root of the problem, and it was only then found that the origin of the nightmares could be traced to those missing two hours. Under separate hypnosis, Betty and Barney Hill said they had been taken by the strange beings into the UFO. I have heard the portion of the tapes covering the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. I spent two days in New Hampshire with the witnesses, and with Dr. Simon and John Fuller. The case represents a general pattern that cannot be separated from the total phenomenon. First, it is interesting to note that, as further details come to the Hill's memories after treatment, the case took on more of the features present in other UFO landings, of which the Hills could not have heard. One such detail is the recollection by Betty Hill that, after their car was stopped and a group of men had come toward them, the creatures had opened the door of the vehicle and pointed a small device at her. When I asked her to what usual object she could compare it, she told me, it could have been a pencil. 
It is not necessary to repeat the descriptions given by the hills of the manner in which they were abducted or of the conditions inside the object. It is enough to say that the statements made under hypnosis by Betty and Barney are in general agreement. And it is also useful to study the detailed accounts of the entities given by the witnesses. Betty states, most of the men are my height. None is as tall as Barney, so I would judge them to be 5 to 5 feet 4 inches. Their chests are larger than ours, their noses were larger, longer, than the average size although I have seen people with noses like theirs, like Jimmy Durante. Their complexions were of gray tone, like a gray paint with a black base, their lips were of bluish tint. Hair and eyes were very dark, possibly black. In a sense, they looked like mongoloids. This sort of round face and broad forehead, along with a certain type of coarseness. The surface of their skin seemed to be a bluish gray, but probably whiter than that. Their eyes moved, and they had pupils. Somehow, I had the feeling they were more like cat's eyes. Barney, on the other hand, says this, the men had rather odd-shaped heads, with a large cranium, diminishing in size as it got toward the chin. And the eyes continued around to the sides of their heads, so that it appeared that they could see several degrees beyond the lateral extent of our vision. This was startling to me. The mouth, was much like when you draw one horizontal line with a short perpendicular line on each end. This horizontal line would represent the lips without the muscle that we have. And it would part slightly as they made this mummy mumming sound. The texture of the skin, as I remembered it from this quick glance, was grayish, almost metallic looking. I didn't notice any hair, or headgear for that matter. I didn't notice any proboscis, there just seemed to be two slits that represented the nostrils. There are some obvious contradictions between the two descriptions. Betty speaks of very dark hair, Barney did not notice any. The men described by Barney do not exactly evoke in my mind the picture of Jimmy Durante. On the other hand, the creatures are strikingly reminiscent of the UFO operators of a large number of stories unknown at the time outside a very small group specialists. Apart from disagreement on the nose and lips, Betty's statement matched the description made by Barney of the shape of the head and the color and appearance of the skin. Another remark by Betty is significant in this respect, I got the impression that the leader and the examiner were different from the crew members. But this is hard to say, because I really didn't want to look at the men. Two other elements are outstanding in this case. One of them is the manner of communication with the strange beings. They communicated among themselves through an audible language, which was definitely not understandable to the witnesses. Yet when they communicated with the hills, their thoughts came through in English. Betty thinks that they spoke English with an accent, while Barney feels that the words and the presence of the entity were two separate things, I did not hear an actual voice. But in my mind, I knew what he was saying. It wasn't as if he were talking to me with my eyes open, and he was sitting across the room from me. It was more as if the words were there, a part of me, and he was outside the actual creation of the words themselves. This remarkable statement, an excellent description of the mechanism that triggered the communication, may well be a clue to the entire episode, and it certainly places the case in the domain of the theory of apparitions, as it is treated, for instance, by parapsychology pioneer G. N. N. Tyrrell in his celebrated 1942 Myers Lectures before the British Society for Psychical Research, of which he was president. Thus, it is noteworthy that the apparent absurdity of the sequence of actions constituting the episode should be reducible to the triggering of high-level perception patterns within the witness's brain and not necessarily through any normal physical process. And this characteristic, in its turn, is reminiscent both of neurophysiological experiments and of reports by the most reliable observers of ghosts, although, of course, Ghosts are distinguished from the class of phenomena we are studying here by the absence of material traces, which makes their interpretation a good deal simpler. And while it is possible that a complete theory of ghosts could confine the phenomena to pyramids within the human nervous system, the same is not true of UFOs. For this reason, therefore, it is crucial to pursue the investigation of past apparitions in relation to reports such as that of the hills. The experiment performed on Betty Hill by the entities is also remarkable. It will be recalled that while she was in the craft, Betty was submitted to a simulated medical test. Under hypnosis, 
She reported that a long needle was inserted into her navel, that she felt pain, and that the pain stopped when the leader made a certain gesture with his hand in front of her eyes. A 15th century French calendar, the Calendrier des Bergiers, shows the tortures inflicted by demons on the people they have taken. The demons are depicted piercing their victims' abdomens with long needles. In fact, the psychological invariant in all these stories is unmistakable. The problem, then, is not to identify it, but to relate it in a rational manner to the physical features encountered during the observations, for example, the tracking by military radar operators of the UFO seen by the hills. Perhaps we should illustrate the difficulty of this problem by using a case less well known than the hills incident, though it is quite as dramatic. It has never appeared in English UFO literature and therefore cannot have influenced American UFO lore. Even in France it is practically unknown. The witness was a woman, and the incident took place on May 20, 1950, at about 4 p.m. in the central region of France, near the Loire River. An official investigation by French local police has substantiated the physical traces mentioned in this report, which can be translated thus, I was hurrying back home to prepare dinner. I was happy and content, and I was singing some popular tune. Everything was calm and still, without any breeze or wind, I was alone on the path. Suddenly, I found myself within a brilliant, blinding light, and I saw two huge black hands appear in front of me. Each one had five fingers, of a black color with a yellowish tinge, somewhat like copper. The fingers were roughly formed, slightly vibrating, or quivering. These hands did not come from behind me, but from above, as if they had been hanging over my head awaiting the proper time to catch me. The black hands did not immediately apply themselves to my head. I probably took two or three steps before they touched me. The hands had no visible arms. The two black hands were applied to my face with violence and squeezed my head, as a bird of prey rushes on its unfortunate, helpless victim. They pulled my head back against a very hard chest, one that seemed to be made of iron, I felt the cold through my hair and behind my neck, but no contact with clothes. The hands were squeezing my head like a formidable vice, not abruptly, but gradually. They were very cold, and their touch made me think that they were not made of flesh. The big fingers were placed on my eyes, and I could not see any more, on my nose so that I could not breathe, and also my mouth, to prevent me from crying out. Unable to defend herself, the abducted woman was at the mercy of the entity, when I was surrounded by the strong, blinding light, I had the feeling I had been paralyzed, and when the hands touched me, I had the very distinct impression of a strong electric discharge, as if I had been shaken by a lightning bolt. My whole body was annihilated, helpless, without reflexes. She heard her aggressor laugh, and she reported that she was hurt by a blow in the back, as if from a metallic object. She was pulled backwards through the bushes. My aggressor pulled me through the bushes until we reached a small pasture, and suddenly he stopped. Why? His hands had gradually slipped down my face, and I tried to call for help but I had no voice left but a tiny, shrill cry. After a while I was able to sit among the brambles. I had a very hard time breathing. My bag was still in my hand, with the money it contained. At last I was able to get up in spite of my weakness, and then I heard some noise to my left inside the bushes. I thought I was going to see my aggressors and recognize their faces, but I saw nothing. Only the branches moved, waving in the air, I saw and heard the bramble scratching the empty space, and the grass being pressed as if under the steps of some invisible being. I was terrified. Softly, I took to the path again, walking with difficulty. My legs were lacerated by the brambles and bleeding, I felt a strange sensation of nervous exhaustion, indefinable, as if I had been electrified by a strong current. In my mouth was a sickening, metallic, bitter taste, my muscles did not obey me. Over my shoulders I felt something like a bar, and in my back a painful heat, as if I had been exposed to flames or to a burning ray. At times I still felt as if I was being brushed by an invisible brush. I must have walked like that for five or six minutes. At the end of the path there was a turn, and from there I could see houses, and then the pain decreased a little bit. Another remarkable observation was yet to come. Everything had lasted a quarter of an hour or twenty minutes, and it seemed that I had lived in an unreal world. 
Abruptly I heard a great noise, like a violent wind during a storm, a sudden displacement of warm air or a violent whirlwind. I saw the trees bending as if under a sudden storm, and I was nearly thrown down. Almost simultaneously, there was a strong, blinding white light. I had the feeling something flew through the air very fast, but I saw nothing. Soon everything became calm again. I felt discomfort and nausea. I reached the house of the lock keeper, and when I opened the door they came toward me and asked me what had happened, because they too had seen a light from their house. The lock keeper's wife asked me what was wrong. When I was able to speak at last, they told me all the fingers were still deeply marked in the flesh of my face, making large red bars. They applied parasite to the scratches on my legs, and an ointment, and bathed me face with cold water. My hands were badly hurt. After a long lapse of time I started again toward the town to buy a few things, without saying anything to anyone, and I came back home laboriously, by another path. The previous evening, the witness in this case had observed a kind of shooting star, which stopped abruptly, then appeared to go up and stay among the other stars for a while, then to grow bigger and take on a kind of swimming motion, its light alternately on and off. Suddenly it left, on a curved trajectory, and reached the horizon at very high speed. She had dismissed the incident from her mind at the time. The official investigation got nowhere and was dropped. The case is still carried as an unsolved abduction attempt. What can we say about such reports? They are neither more nor less believable than other UFO sightings, they are in line with some of the most dramatic stories of older days, which inspired the fairy tales, they are also in line with the visions of the 1897 airship and the incidents that followed it. I now have several other reliable cases in my files where the beings, and in some cases, the UFO itself, were invisible. The records of Anzac, Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, contain another abduction case that occurred on August 21, 1915. In that incident, which I have not been able to confirm, an entire regiment was posted as missing. Taken by the wind. We have now examined several claims of abductions and attempts at kidnappings by the alleged occupants of flying saucers. These episodes are an integral part of the total UFO problem and cannot be solved separately. Historical evidence gathered by Evans Wentz points in the same direction. This sort of belief in fairies being able to take people was very common and exists yet in a good many parts of West Ireland. The good people are often seen there, pointing to Knockmog, in great crowds playing hurley and ball, and one often sees among them the young men and women and children who have been taken. Not only are people taken away, but, as in flying saucer stories, they may be picked up and set down again. A man named John Campbell told Evans Wentz, a man whom I have seen, Roderick McNeil, was lifted by the host and left three miles from where he was taken up. The host went at about midnight. Reverend Kirk gives a few stories of similar extraordinary kidnappings, but the most fantastic legend of all is that attached to Kirk himself. The good reverend is commonly believed to have been taken by strange beings, Mrs. J. McGregor who keeps the key to the old churchyard where there is a tomb to Kirk, though many say there is nothing in it but a coffin filled with stones, told me Kirk was taken into the fairy knoll, which she pointed to just across a little valley in front of us, and is there yet, for the hill is full of caverns and in them the good people have their homes. And she added that Kirk appeared to a relative of his after he was taken. Evans Wentz, who reports this interesting story, made further inquiries regarding the circumstances of Kirk's death. He went to see the successor to Kirk in Aberfoyle, Reverend Taylor, who clarified the story, at the time of his disappearance people said he was taken because the fairies were displeased with him for disclosing their secrets in so public manner as he did. At all events, it seems likely that Kirk was taken ill very suddenly with something like apoplexy while on the fairy knoll, and died there. I have searched the presbyter books and find no record of how Kirk's death really took place, but of course there is not the least doubt of his body being in the grave. Kirk believed in the ability of the good people to perform abductions, and this idea was so widespread that it has come down to us through a variety of channels. This fact enables us to examine in detail four aspects of fairy lore that directly relate to our study, 1. The conditions and purpose of the abductions. 2. 
the cases of release from Agonia and the forms taken by the elves' gratitude when the abducted human being had performed some valuable service during his stay. 3. The belief in the kidnapping activities of the fairy people, and, 4. What I shall call the relativistic aspects of the trip to Magonia. Hartland reports that a Swedish book published in 1775 contains a legal statement, solemnly sworn on April 12, 1671, by the husband of a midwife who was taken to fairyland to assist a troll's wife in giving birth to a child. The author of the statement seems to have been a clergyman. On the authority of this declaration we are called on to believe that the event recorded actually happened in the year 1660. Peter Rom alleges that he and his wife were at their farm one evening late when there came a little man, sword of face and clad in grey, who begged the declarant's wife to come and help his wife then in labour. The declarant, seeing that they had to do with a troll, prayed over his wife, blessed her, and bade her in God's name go with the stranger. She seemed to be borne along by the wind. It is reported that she came home in the same manner, having refused any food offered to her while in the troll's company. In another tale, the midwife's husband accompanies her through the forest. They are guided by the earth man, the gnome who has requested their help. They go through a moss door, then a wooden door, and later through a door of shining metal. A stairway leads them inside the earth, to a magnificent chamber where the earthwife is resting. Kirk reports that in a case whose principles he personally knew the abducted woman found the home of the little people filled with light, although she could not see any lamp or fire. Reverend Kirk also says that later, in the company of another clergyman, he visited a woman, then forty years old, and asked her questions concerning her knowledge of the fairies. It was rumored that for a number of years she had taken almost no nourishment, and that she often stayed late in the fields looking after her sheep that she met there and talked with people she did not know, and that one night she had fallen asleep on a hill and had been carried away into another place before sunrise. This woman, says Kirk, was always melancholy and silent. Magonia, as it appears in such tales, is sometimes a remote country, an invisible island, some faraway place one can reach only by a long journey. Indeed, in some tales, it is a celestial country, as in the Indian story quoted earlier. This parallels the belief in the extraterrestrial origin of UFOs so popular today. But a second, and equally widespread, theory, is that Magonia constitutes a sort of parallel universe, which coexists with our own. It is made visible and tangible only to selected people, and the doors that lead through it are tangential points, known only to the elves and a few of their initiates. Hartland gives tales that illustrate the latter theory, such as the following, in Nisdale a fairy rewards the kindness of a young mother, to whom she had committed her baby to suckle, by taking her on a visit to fairyland. A door opened in a green hillside, disclosing a porch which the nurse and her conductor entered. There the lady dropped three drops of a precious dew on the nurse's left eyelid, and they were admitted to a beautiful land watered with meandering rivulets and yellow with corn, where the trees were laden with fruits which dropped honey. The nurse was here presented with magical gifts, and when a green dew had baptized her right eye she was enabled to behold further wonders. On returning the fairy passed her hand over the woman's eye and restored its natural powers. This tale brings us to our second point, that of the gratitude shown by the elves in return for services performed by humans, and the form such gratitude takes. The gratitude itself is evidenced by many stories of elvish gifts in Scandinavian and Northern European tales, such as this one, a German midwife, who was summoned by a waterman, or Nix, to aid a woman in labor, was told by the latter, I am a Christian woman as well as you, and I was carried off by a waterman, who changed me. When my husband comes in now and offers you money, take no more from him than you usually get, or else he will twist your neck. Take good care. In another story, the midwife is asked how much she wants. She answers she will not take more from them than from other people, and the elf replies, that's lucky for thee. Hadst thou demanded more, it would have gone ill with thee. In spite of that, she received her apron full of gold. In a Pomeranian story, the midwife similarly replies to the same question, and the mannequin says, now then, lift up thy apron, and fills it with rubbish that lay in the corner of the room. He then takes his lantern and politely escorts her home. 
but when she shakes out her apron, pure gold falls on the floor. Elvish gifts have a magical character that could be illustrated with tales from practically any country. Chinese folklore, in particular, gives numerous examples of this. In one tale, the dwarf fills the woman's apron with something she must not look at before she reaches her house. Naturally she takes a look as soon as the dwarf has vanished, and sees that she is carrying black coals. Angered, she throws them away, retaining two as evidence of the dwarf's bad treatment. She arrives home and discovers the black coals have turned into precious stones. But when she goes back to find the other coals, they are all gone. There are numerous stories of humans who have gone to Magonia of their own will, either taking a message or bringing one back, or performing some service for the supernatural beings who live there. But, and this is my third point, we also have numerous accounts of abductions by the fairies. As in the cases of UFO abductions published by Bud Hopkins in his book Intruders, they take men and women, especially pregnant women or young mothers, and they also steal young children. Sometimes, they are said to substitute a false child for the real one, leaving in place of the real child a broom with rugs wrapped around it or one of their children, a changeling. By the belief in changelings I mean a belief that fairies and other imaginary beings are on the watch for young children or, sometimes even for adults, that they may, if they can find them unguarded, seize and carry them off, leaving in their place one of them. This belief is not confined to Europe. It is found in regions as remote from Europe as China and the American Pacific Coast. Once the parents have recognized their child has been taken, what should they do? Hartland says that a method in favor in the north of Scotland is to take the suspected elf to some known haunt of its race, generally, we are told, some spot where peculiar coughing sounds are heard, or to some barrow, or stone circle, and lay it down. An offering of bread, butter, milk, cheese, eggs and flesh or fowl must accompany the child. But sometimes more radical methods have been used, and we can only pity any poor children who may have been ill-treated because their superstitious parents thought they looked like elves. As late as May 17, 1884, it was reported in the London Daily Telegraph, two women were arrested at Clonmel and charged with cruelty toward a child three years old. They thought he was a changeling and, by ill-treating him, hoped to obtain the real child from the elves. And there is no question that in medieval times the same superstition has led to the death of children who have congenital defects. Sometimes the same treatment applies to adults who have been changed, and Hartland gives a funny example of such a case. A tale from Badenoch represents the man as discovering the fraud from finding his wife, a woman of unruffled temper, suddenly turned a shrew. So he piles up a great fire and threatens to throw the occupant of the bed upon it unless she tells him what has become of his wife. She then confesses that the latter has been carried off, and she has been appointed successor. But by his determination he happily succeeds in recapturing his own at a certain fairy knoll near Inverness. Of course, the UFO myth has not yet reached such proportions, but we are perhaps not quite far from it. American television series such as The Twilight Zone have capitalized on this aspect in episodes that assume that the human race has been infiltrated by extraterrestrials who differ from humans in small details only. This is not a new idea, as the belief in changelings shows. What was the purpose of such abductions? The idea advanced by students of folk tales is again very close to a current theory about UFOs, that the purpose of such contact is a genetic one. According to Hartland, the motive assigned to fairies in northern stories is that of preserving and improving their race, on the one hand by carrying off human children to be brought up among the elves and to become united with them, and on the other hand by obtaining the milk and fostering care of human mothers for their own offspring. Similarly, Bud Hopkins, the researcher and artist who has become one of the most visible experts on the abduction reports, wrote in 1987, do the UFO occupants want to lessen the distance between our race and theirs in order to land, eventually, and join us on our planet? Or do these aliens merely wish to enrich their own stock and then depart as mysteriously as they arrived? Such is not always the purpose of abduction, however, and people are often returned by the elves after nothing more than a dance or a game. But a strange phenomenon often takes place, the people who have spent a day in Elfland come back to this world one year or more, older. This is our fourth point, and quite a remarkable one. 
Time does not pass there as it does here, and we have in such stories the first idea of the relativity of time. How did this idea come to the storytellers ages ago? What inspired them? No one can answer such questions. But it is a fact that the non-symmetry of the time element between Magonia and our world is present in the tales from all countries. Discussing this supernatural lapse of time, Hartland relates the true story of Rhys and Llewellyn, recorded about 1825 in the Vale of Neath, Wales. Rhys and Llewellyn were servants to a farmer. As they went home one night, Rhys told his friend to stop and listen to the music. Llewellyn heard no music. But Rhys had to dance to the tune he had heard a hundred times. He begged Llewellyn to go ahead with the horses, saying that he would soon overtake him, but Llewellyn arrived home alone. The next day, he was suspected of murdering Rhys and was jailed. But a farmer who was skilled in fairy matters guessed the truth. Several men gathered, among them the narrator of the story, and took Llewellyn to the spot where he said his companion had vanished. Suddenly, hush! cried Llewellyn. I hear music, I hear sweet harps. All listened but could hear nothing. Llewellyn's foot was on the outer edge of the fairy ring. He told the narrator to place his foot on his, and then he too heard the sounds of many harps and saw a number of little people dancing in a circle twenty feet or so in diameter. After him, each of the party did the same and observed the same thing. Among the dancing little folk was Rhys. Llewellyn caught him by his frock as he passed close to them and pulled him out of the circle. At once Rhys asked, where are the horses? And asked them to let him finish the dance, which had not lasted more than five minutes. And he could never be persuaded of the time that had elapsed. He became melancholy, fell ill, and soon after died. Such stories can be found in Kitely's The Fairy Mythology and other books. The story of Rhys and Llewellyn is remarkable because it dates from the 19th century, thus providing continuity between fairy and UFO lore. In tales of this type, several modes of recovery of the persons taken are offered. One of them consists in touching the abducted man with a piece of iron, and the objection of supernatural beings to this metal is one of the themes of fairy lore. Near Bridgend, Wales is a place where it is reported that a woman who had been taken by the fairies came back ten years later and thought she had not been away more than ten days. Hartland gives another charming story on the same theme, concerning a boy named Gitto Bach, or Little Griffith, a farmer's son who disappeared, during two whole years nothing was heard of him, but at length one morning when his mother, who had long and bitterly mourned for him as dead, opened the door, whom should she sitting on the threshold but Gitto with a bundle under his arm. He was dressed and looked exactly as when she last saw him, for he had not grown a bit. Where have you been all this time? asked his mother. Why, it was only yesterday I went away, he replied, and opening the bundle he showed her a dress the little children as he called them, had given him for dancing with them. The dress was of white paper without seam. With maternal caution she put it into the fire. The best known stories where time relativity is the main theme are of course of the Rip Van Winkle type, patterned after numerous folk tales that allegedly concern actual events. Strangely enough, we again find the identical theme in ages old Chinese folklore. Witness the story of Wang Chi, one of the holy men of the Taoists. One day, as Wang Chi wandered through the mountains of Ku Chao gathering firewood, he saw a grotto where some old men were playing chess. He came in to watch their game and laid down his axe. One of the old men gave him something like a date stone and instructed him to place it in his mouth. No sooner had he done so than hunger and thirst passed away. Some time later, one of the aged players told him, It is long since you came here, you should go home now. But as he turned to pick up his axe, Wing Chi found that he handle had turned into dust. He reached the valley, but found not hours or days but centuries had passed, and nothing remained of the world as he had known it. A similar tradition exists in Denmark. In a tale which is typical of the pattern, a bride thoughtlessly walked through the fields during the festivities of her wedding day and passed a mound where the elves were making merry. Again, we have here a description of the little people close to the magical object sometimes described as a large, flat, round table, sometimes as a hillock. A disc or a large cone resting on the ground would fit that description. In describing the fairy knoll, Hartland writes, the hillock was standing, 
As is usual on such occasions, on red pillars, the wee folk offered the bride a cup of wine, and she joined in a dance with them. Then she hastened back home, where she could not find her family. Everything had changed in the village. Finally, on hearing her cries, a very old woman exclaimed, Was it you, then, who disappeared at my grandfather's brother's wedding, a hundred years ago? At these words, the poor girl fell down and expired. It is fascinating indeed to find such tales, which antedate Einstein's and Langevin's relativistic traveler by centuries. The supernatural lapse of time in Magonia is often allied to the theme of love between the abducted human and one of the beings. Such is the pattern of the story of Oshin, or Oisin. Once, when he was young man, Oisin fell asleep under a tree. He woke up suddenly and found a richly dressed lady of more than mortal beauty looking at him. She was the queen of the legendary land of Tir Nog, and she invited him to share her palace. Oisin and the queen were in love and happy, but the hero was warned not to go into the palace gardens or to stand on a certain flat stone. Naturally, he transgressed the order, and, when he stood upon the stone, he beheld his native land, suffering from oppression and violence. He went to the queen and told her he must return. How long do you think you have been with me? She asked. Thrice seven days, said he. Thrice seven years, was the answer. But he still wanted to go back. She then gave him a black horse from whose back he must not alight during his trip in the other world, for fear of seeing the power of time suddenly fall on him. But he forgot the warning when an incident induced him to dismount and at once he became a feeble, blind, and helpless old man. It is not necessary to spend time here, to dwell in detail, on the tales of the island of Avalon, Morgan the Fay, the legend of Ogier the Dane, and the magical travels of King Arthur. All these traditions insist on the peculiar nature of time in the other world. Nor is this limited to European history, as Hartland again points out, many races having traditions of a culture god, that is, of a superior being who has taught them agriculture and the arts of life, and led them to victory over their enemies, add that he has gone away from them for a while, and that he will some day come back again. Quetzalcoatl and Viracocha, the culture gods of Mexico and Peru, are familiar instances of this. Similarly, Vishnu has yet a tenth incarnation to accomplish the final destruction of this world's wicked. At the end of the present age, according to Hindu tradition, he will be revealed in the sky, seated on a white horse and holding a blazing sword. Such great traditions are common knowledge, like the abductions of Enoch, Ezekiel, Elijah, and others in the Bible. What is not commonly known is that such legends have been built on the popular belief in numerous actual stories of the less glorious, more ordinary and personal, type we have reviewed here. For instance, while all books about Mexico mention Quetzalcoatl, they usually ignore the local beliefs in little black beings, vehicles, whose pranks we have already mentioned. While their relationship with modern Latin American UFO lore is clear, they also provide an obvious parallel to the fairy faith. In his study of the tales of Tenajapa, anthropologist Brian Strauss reports of vehicles, they are believed to be beings from another world, and some have been seen flying with some kind of rocket-like thing attached to the back. With this rocket they are said occasionally to have carried off people. Similarly, Gordon Creighton reports, vehicle of the Tsotsils flies through the air. Sometimes he steals women, and the women so taken are remarkably prolific, and may bear a child once a week, or once a month, or even daily. The offspring are black, and they learn the art of flying inside their father's cave. Brian Strauss's Indian informants reported that a flurry of vehicles was sighted about 20 years ago which would take us back to 1947, the year of the sighting by pilot Kenneth Arnold over Mount Rainier, in Washington, which gave birth to the term flying saucer. It was a very significant period in UFO history. This is the end of Dimensions, a casebook of alien contact part 6. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please proceed to part 7, before YouTube deletes it. Thank you for listening.